Hello, and thank you for joining us today. A short announcement in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking audience. Hola, y muchas gracias por acompañarnos. La conversación de hoy será en inglés, pero contamos con interpretación simultánea en español. En la parte inferior de sus pantallas, pueden dar clic en el botón del mundo. Welcome to North America's Semiconductor Moment. My name is Isabel Migoya, and I'm the Senior Coordinator of Convergence Lab. A series of events Arizona State University organizes in Mexico with the goal of exploring shared challenges and opportunities. We organize these events with, in collaboration with partners like Future Tense. Future Tense is a partnership of Slate Magazine, New America, a think tank in Washington, DC, and Arizona State University that explores the impact of technology on society. Special thanks to Mia Armstrong Lopez, managing editor of Future Tense, and to Angela and Riley from the New America events team for making this possible. We're really excited for our conversation today that will explore the tremendous opportunities for stronger semiconductor supply chains across the United States and Mexico, as well as efforts to date and what lies ahead. We encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So now let me introduce you our panelists. Rina Paul Wetzen is a director for global policy with the Semiconductor Industry Association, and I must say she's a proud ASU graduate. David Talbot is Associate Director of Global Policy at the Milken Institute. Gerardo Lameda is the Head of Cooperation and Education Affairs at the Embassy of Mexico in the United States. And as our moderator, we have Kevin McGuinness, who is the Managing Director for Strategic Technology Initiatives at ASU. So with this fantastic lineup of speakers, I turn the floor over to Kevin to start this conversation. Thank you so much, Kevin. Wonderful. Thank you, Isabel. And thank you to New America Future Tense and the Convergence Lab for hosting this conversation today. I'm so grateful uh, for the opportunity to be a moderator with a, a wonderful group of experts that we've assembled. We have views of think tanks, industry, the Embassy of Mexico and the United States here. Uh, before I introduce our panelists and turn it over to them, they're the ones you want to hear from, I'll just take a minute to set the stage for this conversation. And so if you're following the news, you, you probably see something about semiconductors almost daily. Uh, they're tied to national security, trade, economic development, and for good reason. So semiconductors power our digital economy from the phone in your pocket to the satellites in space and basically everywhere in between. Um, in the last couple of years, you may have experienced semiconductor supply chain disruptions caused by COVID-19. I think that brought home for many people uh, the importance of these small, tiny objects that power our daily lives, uh, whether in cars or TVs or defense systems, we saw a lot of disruption in the supply chain. And it really emphasized the need to have more resilience uh, related to supply chain production here in North America, closer to home. In response to some of those challenges, uh, the United States government put together a package called the Chips and Science Act. It includes $52 billion in subsidies, tax credits, and investments, uh, all with the goal of bringing advanced manufacturing uh, of semiconductors back to the United States and also building supply chain resiliency. Um, there's been a lot of focus in the dialogue around the United States when it comes to the, those supply chains, but really this is a global challenge. It's not just about the United States and the CHIPS Act isn't only about the United States, it's also about our close partners as well. And that's because semiconductors require a highly global supply chain. Uh, and also it would be prohibitively expensive to bring every element of that supply chain back to the United States. I think the estimates something like a trillion dollars to bring all pieces of the supply chain back to the United States. So. We need to think about how to work with our partners and allies uh, in order to build supply chain resiliency, in order to make sure we're not too dependent on countries that are far away and might be disrupted uh, in terms of production of these critical materials. So what better place uh, and what closer partner than Mexico uh, to, to work with? And there are many reasons why. Uh, Mexico's geographic proximity, strong manufacturing sector, favorable terms of trade, all those things uniquely position it to join a US-led global supply chain reshuffling. And as we've embarked on this journey, um, it involves a lot of partners. And we've been very fortunate as Arizona State University to work closely with the Embassy of Mexico in thinking about some of these challenges. Uh, Mexico's ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Moctezuma, uh, he visited uh, Arizona State in November and agreed to a memorandum of understanding with our president, President Michael Crow, that sort of formalized our ability to cooperate around the Chips and Science Act, to think about what opportunities we might pursue together, whether in terms of workforce, R&D, uh, or other shared opportunities. And we're really grateful to the entire team at the Embassy of Mexico for that work with us. Uh, and now we have an opportunity to kind of take that to the next level and work with groups like Semiconductor Industry Association and other think tanks like Milken Institute 
to really define the scope of the challenge and then make sure that when it comes to the supply chains, uh, we're taking a holistic approach that includes not only the United States, but also our close partners in Mexico. So with, with that as kind of context and to help set the stage for our work, um, I'd like to turn it over in a moment here to Rena Paul Goodson, who uh, Isabel also introduced, but just to give you a word of background about her, uh, she's responsible for all international trade policy, including trade agreements, market access, and emerging market development on behalf of the Semiconductor Industry Association, SIA. She's also an attorney and previously served as general counsel at Microtech, a 3D printed chip packaging company. She has experience beyond semiconductors too in uh, global health policy and global intellectual property. So really fortunate to have her here today. Um, she also, I wanted to thank SIA because they've been such a wonderful partner to us uh, over several years, not just in my current role here at Arizona State, but in my previous roles in the federal government. I've always uh, been really fortunate to get to work with SIA. And I think they bring real data and rigor to policy discussions. And um, we're just grateful for all the work that they do to, uh, to advocate on behalf of the industry. So with that, uh, I'll pose my first question here to Rena. And the question is for audience, you know, audience, members of the audience who might not be familiar, can you tell us a little bit about the Semiconductor Industry Association? Uh, what is it? What's its role in helping the industry navigate complex uh, questions like the CHIPS Act and like global supply chains? Sure. And uh, thank you so much, Kevin. We're really excited to be part of this panel. Uh, so to introduce SIA, SIA is the voice of the U.S. Uh, semiconductor industry. Uh, the Semiconductor Industry Association advances policies that help the industry grow and unites uh, semiconductor companies around common challenges. Uh, SIA seeks to strengthen U.S. leadership in semiconductor manufacturing, design, and research by working with Congress, the administration, and key industry stakeholders to encourage policies and regulations that fuel innovation, propel business, and drive international competition. So SIA advocates and organizes industry action around a few key uh, issues. So first, uh, defining strategies to promote and maintain world leadership uh, in technology for our members, uh, advocating for public policies that provide a fair field for competition, whether that's through trade agreements um, or other alliances, uh, promoting fair and open trade, and tracking and distributing statistical information on market trends for our membership as well. So that's a little bit about what SIA is. Wonderful thing. Thanks, Rena. And that's a helpful context for, for our next panelist to introduce himself. So David, uh, th thanks for being here. David Talbot for the audience is uh, Associate Director for Global Policy at the Milken Institute. And in that role, he leads the Institute's research on key issues, including global, mar global markets, international trade, investment, regional economic competitiveness, and energy transition. Prior to Milken, uh, David also served in the U.S. Department of Commerce under Secretary Pritzker, and there he focused on commercial diplomacy. He led a number of signature initiatives to expand economic relationships, including with Mexico. Uh, he also has worked on several presidential campaigns. He has a PhD in international political economy, so he's a real expert in this area. And uh, we're especially fortunate because he spent the last several months looking at this specific question, the question of U.S.-Mexico supply chains, um, analyzing it, thinking about potential recommendations to move the relationship forward. Uh, and so my first question to you, David, is how did you become interested in this topic? And, and, and why do you think this might be a critical moment for us in terms of semiconductors and the relationship between the United States and Mexico? Yeah, thanks again for uh, for having us, Kevin. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with uh, Rina and Ferrado in particular, and you as well, because you know over the course of the last few months, I've learned so much about this topic from, from the three of you. So this is uh, really a great opportunity to share some of those findings and uh, continue the discussion. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't know that the Milken Institute, so we're a uh, nonprofit and nonpartisan think tank located in Los Angeles, but with offices around the world. Uh, we are really focused on building our presence in Mexico and our research on Mexico. So we actually had our first event in Mexico City last week and are uh, launching into a much broader project on nearshoring that we hope to publish this fall. But, you know, semiconductors are really the obvious place to start, both because of the industry's importance in the, um, uh, you know, the overall global economy, and then also the ongoing shift in global supply chains that we're seeing in the, in the current moment. So, you know, as you mentioned at the top, uh, you know, the CHIPS Act is really uh, you know, what is driving this North American semiconductor moment. So the U.S. passed the CHIPS Act in response to the pandemic era uh, supply chain bottlenecks. 
uh, and then also our rising geopolitical tensions with uh, with China and the $52 billion are, are focused in incentives and subsidies and R&D. And the bill has, you know, with some U.S. allies, created some, some new tensions, some new frictions, particularly with the European Union. But in the U.S.-Mexico uh, context, it really creates a remarkable opportunity for cooperation. So for the U.S. perspective, you know, U.S. officials are looking for viable alternatives to China and, you know, uh, supplements to, um, uh, you know, Taiwan and other um, Southeast Asian nations that are critical for, uh, for co-production in semiconductor supply chains. For Mexico, the act really presents an opportunity to uh, you know, help build on its existing footprint in the semiconductor industry and really carve out a bigger space in a uh, high tech and high growth industry. I think for the bilateral relationship, it's it's quite important as well. I think it's it's one where the frictions all too often are what dominate the headlines and there really is just such a, a deep, strong partnership um, you know, not purely in the economic space, but also, uh, you know, also the social. So over the last uh, two years, the U.S. and Mexico have put in place a number of cooperative bilateral and trilateral mechanisms uh, with Canada as well through the U.S.-Mexico high-level high economic dialogue and also the North America Leaders Summit. But, um, you know, the, the window here is closing. So I think that the time of this conversation is very important. I think that uh, you know this year in particular, I would really need to see some forward progress to make sure that uh, you know both the U.S. and Mexico are able to to capitalize on this uh, this opportunity during the current um, uh, industry investment cycle. Well, thanks, David, and and great job teeing up our next speaker, who has been involved in in many of those dialogues you mentioned, whether the North North American Leadership Summit, uh, the high level economic dialogue. Uh, our next speaker, Gerardo Lameda, is at the center of all of that, and he's the head of cooperation and education affairs at the U.S. Embassy of Mexico in the United States. Um, he's a wealth of experience in senior roles across the government of Mexico, including previously leading the embassy's trade office, serving as economic attache, as well as an official in the Mexican Ministry of Economy. Um, I'm so grateful to have had the chance to work with Gerardo over the last year or so, and, and really the entire team at the Embassy of Mexico. And it's really, I think, thanks to their tireless efforts that this conversation is possible today, that the industry is interested in Mexico, that there's this moment where we might be able to have real cooperation around semiconductor, semiconductor supply chains in our two countries. Um, and so with that, Gerardo, a question to you. Um, how, you know, why is the Mexican government interested in semiconductors uh, and, and what's the main driver behind it and all of the attention that you've paid to it? Because it really has been a lot of work over the last year that I know you and the entire team have, have focused on this industry. Thank you for your kind introduction, Kevin. And um, I would like to thank first the invitation to participate on this event with Arizona State University to Andres Martinez, Paula Hidalgo, to Angela Spidalet, and the New American team as well, and Isabel Migoya. And on behalf of Ambassador Moctezuma, the ambassador of Mexico in the US, he sends his uh, regards and readings and best wishes for the success of this event. And it's a pleasure to share this panel with distinguished friends like Rina and David as well. So in response to your question, Kevin, for many reasons, the semiconductor industry is critical for the future of North America. The competitiveness of many industries depends on the semiconductor industry and its supply chain. It is also the base of the digital economy, as you all know. And North America is urged to build a competitive ecosystem for the semiconductor industry that does not depend on other regions abroad. We need to make North America self-sufficient in the whole process of semiconductor and its supply chain. So it's a matter of national and regional security. And as you all know, there is not a single country in the world that by itself is totally integrated to the full production process of semiconductors. So several countries have specialized in different processes of the production and stages of the supply chain. Therefore, it seems difficult for the United States 
to develop all the production process of semiconductors alone in the short run. So the US and North America needs allies and reliable partners. And here is where Mexico plays a relevant role. Mexico is a competitive and reliable ally to complement the semiconductor industry in North America. We are, trade, we are top trading partners of the US and have strong bilateral relations since decades. Over the years, Mexico has developed an advanced manufacturing export platform of relevant industries and many other products. The USMCA has a reliable legal framework that provides certainty to business, trade, and investment. We have strategic location and proximity to the main semiconductor facilities in the US, for example, in Arizona, Texas, and California. Mexico has developed efficient infrastructure and connectivity in one of the busiest borders in the world in terms of trade and uh, customs. Mexico has a network of 13 free trade agreements with over 50 countries. So it means a lot of trade without import duties. We also have abundant talent and workforce Mexico has one of the largest ratio of graduates in engineering in the OECD countries. So nobody understands better than Mexico the American way of doing business. And among, among other factors, Mexico is ready to complement the US semiconductor industry and its supply chain. And just as an example, Tesla's recent announcement for a large investment in Mexico confirms that we are ready to continue complementing the industries of North America and its supply chains. Thank you. Thanks, Gerardo. And I think the approach that the government of Mexico has taken, you know, looking at different elements of the supply chain, figuring out where the comparative advantage might be, uh, has been very strategic. And, and thanks to your efforts to help shape to shape that. Um, Rina, a question back to you. Since the CHIPS Act passed uh, last year, and even before that, we've seen tremendously uh, significant investments in the United States related to semiconductor manufacturing facilities. And some of the numbers are just incredible, 200 billion, um, in, in some cases up to 80 billion in Arizona specifically. As companies are thinking about making these huge, huge capital investments, you know, what, are, what are they taking into account? What are the factors that uh, sway their decision one way or the other when they're deciding where to make, where to make such large investments? Hi, uh, sure. The industry is kind of in a, a potential shift at the moment. Um, we're coming out of the pandemic, you know, uh, we have seen that we need to be prepared for shocks to the supply chain and need to find ways to be resilient. Um, part of this is addressing the national security issues around uh, chips and seeking to relocate our supply chains to locations with our natural allies. So part of this has meant for the US to invest heavily again in US manufacturing. So semiconductors, to give a little bit of a background, were invented in the US uh, more than 60 years ago and US chip companies continue to lead the world in researching, design, designing and producing the world's most advanced chips. Uh, America's global leadership in chip technology, however, is under greater threat than it has been in decades. The share of global chip manufacturing capacity in the US for example, has shrunk from 37% to 12% over the last 30 years. And it's mostly due to aggressive government incentives offered by overseas competitors. Uh, three quarters of the chips, uh, the world's chip manufacturing capacity is now concentrated in East Asia, with China projected to command the largest share of production by 2030, uh, due to its, its government's massive investments in this sector. So the dramatic decline in the US share of global chip manufacturing, coupled with insufficient federal investments in semiconductor uh, research and design, uh, undermine our country's long-term ability to produce the advanced chips needed to support our economic recovery, power our military and critical infrastructure, create new high paying jobs and reduce costs for clean energy technologies you know, and drive other innovations in, in the must win technologies of tomorrow. Uh, for our country to succeed in the future, we must continue to lead uh, the world in semiconductor technology. 
But as Gerardo was just saying, we can't do everything alone. We need to make sure the supply chain involves our partners who have specific expertise um, and a competitive advantage in certain parts of the supply chain. So as South um, East Asia holds most of this uh, supply chain, the location is still risky due to its proximity, proximity to China. Uh, the industry considers several factors when they're evaluating potential new locations. Uh, first would be the trade environment. How easy is it to move items in and out of the country as, you know, in the development of a chip, it sometimes goes to hundreds of different locations uh, before becoming a finished product. And that time in between is just critical. Second, the business environment, the taxes, customs, times, um, and ease of uh, permitting issues, um, and general ease of business uh, indexes. Uh, third is the reliable availability of water and electricity. So that needs to be provided in large amounts without interruptions. And fourth, and you know, equally important, is the availability of workforce, both for training and development. And there's a large shortage across the world. Uh, so we're all kind of seeking what, to figure out what we can do about that issue. Well, thanks, Rina. And, and I think that last point that you made on, on workforce is especially important. I know all of us have been thinking a lot about it. Arizona State University has been very focused on it. And I think we'll come back to that later in the conversation. But thanks for that overview, because I think it helps to explain why are we seeing these huge, huge numbers and, and what are some of the factors that lead companies to choose one place over the other. Um, next, back to, to David. Uh, we've, we've had a number of conversations about this topic over the last several months. Uh, as you've been learning more about the U.S.-Mexico relationship, especially related to supply chain, what, what surprised you? You know, you've looked at a lot of different countries. You've looked in, at this topic for quite a bit of time. Um, what was unexpected as you went about your research? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I think that's a fantastic question. And, uh, you know, Rena's really helped uh, team me up well here. And I think there are two things that I would point to in particular as, uh, you know, surprises that emerged over the course of my research. I think one more focused on the U.S. and one more focused on Mexico. I think in the U.S. context, for somebody whose background is heavily in international trade and investment and is, you know, particularly compared to the three of you, a relative newcomer on semiconductors, I was shocked by the scale of the challenge in building for the U.S. Actually, building resilient semiconductor supply chains. I think, um, you know, as you and Rena were just discussing, the Chips Act is driving a huge surge in U.S. investment in both semiconductor fabs and then also, uh, you know, manufacturing equipment. Uh, but uh, as the saying goes, uh, you know, a semiconductor uh, supply chain is only as strong as its, uh, as its weakest link. And I think here, when you're looking at the, you know, back end of line manufacturing processes, so assembly, test, and packaging, and then also even after that, when you're looking at um, device assembly, those are two areas where the U.S. is really going to have a, you know, a very difficult time, uh, you know, reshoring any of that. So I think it's it really underscores the opportunity that's available for, uh, you know, for Mexico and for other uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. partners as the U.S. looks to, you know, shift uh, shift some of these supply chains or at least, uh, you know, diversify its uh, its supply chains. Um, away from, uh, you know, East and Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, there's some some pretty wild stats on that, actually, I'll, I'll grab here quickly. So, I mean, on assembly, test, and packaging, the U.S. maintains only 3% of global capacity and has no commercially competitive producers of printed circuit boards and substrate, which are key, key material components of those back-end-of-line manufacturing processes. Uh, whereas uh, I think 80 over 80 percent of global ATP capacity and 95 percent of substrate suppliers are still in Asia. So I think those are just some some key data points which really underscore uh, you know the opportunity for Mexico and also just the level of the challenge for the U.S. in um, uh, building uh, building resilience through uh, through relocation, new investment, and diversification. I think when it comes to, to Mexico, you know, I think a lot of the uh, barriers to investment are well known and broadly discussed. Some were just raised by Rena, but I think one of the things that really emerged in my conversation and is somewhere that the, you know, the Mexican government has really been, you know, uh, focusing a lot of energy and attention to, but it's the, it's the lack of, of information as a barrier to investment. So I think this, this is, can really be divided into two subcomponents. So I think one is actually mapping 
the existing ecosystem, uh, particularly at the level of second and third tier suppliers. So there are already, uh, you know, four, you know, back end of line facilities in Mexico that have been there for a long time. So there is this established footprint. It's uh, Texas Instruments, uh, Skyworks, and Infineon. Um, and earlier this year at the North American Leaders Summit, the US, Canada, and Mexico reached an agreement to uh, map North American semiconductor supply chains. And I think it's imperative that this moves forward quickly because you know, through my conversations, it's very clear that these you know, Mexican facilities are already sourcing a lot of their you know, materials and components from within Mexico, but being able to identify uh, identify them for, you know, a broader industry audience so that they can, you know, both these new U.S. fabs and also potential future investments in Mexico can build on this existing footprint is key. I think the other key point that uh, really emerged here is that because, uh, you know, there are four, these four facilities, and most of them have been there for you know, decades at this point, I think there's limited insight into the total cost of ownership uh, for new investments. So I think, you know, a lot of this, you know, the SIA, other industry groups have been very actively involved uh, you know, in partnership with BCG and, and other governments in sort of mapping out what it costs to, you know, construct new, um, you know, semiconductor fabs, but also back in facilities in the U.S. and other countries. And I think that as companies are considering making new investments in Mexico, that, uh, you know, really trying to, to increase information, awareness, and the availability of data on how much, you know, the actual life cycle costs of these investments will be are, are really key. Th thanks, David. And I think, you know, a couple of things, and this is just for our audience, you know, I, I'm not a semiconductor engineer, but I've, you might hear a lot about packaging. And when you hear about packaging, it's not like, you know, the box that we put it in and that ship, ship it in, it's actually the interconnects. After we finished making the chip, you have to then connect it to other chips, that's the package. And that's actually a really critical part of the process that even if we build all these facilities in the United States, you may have been reading about, um, right now, most of that doesn't occur, as David said, in the United States, we might have to actually ship those chips still back over to Asia to be packaged before they can be put into a finished product and, and used in your cell phone or um, your, your everyday uh, devices that you might have around your house. Um, so just keeping in mind that idea of, of packaging as a key element of the supply chain that we still have some gaps in. Um, question back to Gerardo. Um, again, a little bit building on what you were saying before, what would it look like if we did deepen the supply chain uh, between the United States and, and Mexico? What are the key areas? And, and maybe I know you've been focused on packaging. How did you arrive at that? What, what was some of the thinking behind packaging as a key potential area for Mexico to focus on? Yes, uh, thank you, Kevin. That's a good question, especially because the position of Mexico is to complement the industry and the supply chain of the US and Canada. And uh, one way of complementing in a most effective and competitive way is through the labor intensive processes where Mexico has a comparative advantage. So the labor intensive processes in the semiconductor production is related to design and the back end, which is assembly packaging and testing. So that's the areas where Mexico has a, a better position to, to be part and be uh, considered a complementing partner in this industry. So this is uh, one specific area that we are developing. We are also focusing in uh, being a supplier of materials and inputs relevant to the industry, where there is a lot of potential for Mexico. And as you also know, and in complement to what David said, which I am glad that he is very notable of Mexico industry, and he is very involved. Uh, for Mexico, semiconductor industry is not new because we have had the major semiconductor companies since many decades ago. For instance, Intel in Jalisco since, since the 90s, Skywork Solutions since 1964 in Mexicali, and Texas Instruments since 1984 in Aguascalientes, and the most recent was Infineon in Tijuana. So this is critical for uh, the region 
uh, as you know, we all share as neighbors and partners in the USMCA, we share common uh, concerns, common uh, challenges and common opportunities. So we all want to develop North America to become again the most dynamic region in the world in terms of competitiveness, in terms of technology, workforce development. And uh, we are really committed to bring back to the US and to North America, the leadership in the production of semiconductors. Thank you. Thanks, Gerardo. That's a, a great goal. I think that goal of interconnectedness, connect, connectivity, and then also competitiveness for the entire continent is the, the vision that we should all we should all drive towards. Um, well, I'm just gonna mention to our audience, we're at about 2.30 Eastern time. Um, we'll probably take questions from the audience in about 15 minutes. So if you haven't submitted your questions already, uh, please think on them, please submit them, and then we'll turn to a few from the audience in again, about 15 minutes. Um, one last question for our panelists in sequence, and then we'll kind of go to open open discussion. Uh, Farina, specifically on Mexico, you know, both Gerardo and, and also David mentioned some of the existing facilities that uh, semiconductor firms have, have in Mexico. How, how does the industry view Mexico today as a potential site of expansion? Uh, what factors do, do they look at when they're thinking about expanding or for the first time relocating there if they don't have existing operations there? Just put the, I guess, put Mexico in context for the current set of decisions around our semiconductor partners. Sure. Uh, as part of the North American Semiconductor Corridor, uh, which David touched upon um, previously, um, I think the industry is looking seriously at Mexico and particularly as a site for additional ETP, the advanced um, testing and packaging. Uh, the proximity the proximity to the US is very attractive for security reasons. Um, and it, it, is it is certainly true that all of the governments here uh, would like to see more in this assembly test and packaging. Um, however, a few challenges do need to be overcome. Uh, first, as the other locations um, are well establishing in are well established in providing significant government subsidies for these very costly investments, uh, Mexico would need to show some federal indication of interest in uh, being competitive in that way. Um, it would be impossible for the companies to invest uh, in places that cost more, uh, despite security um, concerns of the government. Uh, second, as we also touched on, the workforce development piece needs to be addressed to solve um, the labor shortages that would result from additional investment as well. Um, additionally, favorable and reliable tax schemes need to be um, implemented. Um, if these issues can be tackled, an ecosystem could be developed around certain areas that are already involved in the electric vehicles and electronics manufacturing to create hubs for the semiconductor supply chain. Thanks, Rina. Great, great summary of both the kind of opportunity and then also some of the challenges. And we have a great group here to talk about, I think, some of those challenges as well. Um, David, you're summarizing your research, turning to you, what are three recommendations you'd make? And, and maybe if some of those recommendations might address some of the challenges that, that Rina raised, um, you know, what, what do you think are the three key things that we need to do to move the relationship forward? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think um, I think it's a great uh, it's a great question. I mean, my my overarching takeaway here, you know, as I mentioned up top, really is that this this opportunity is real. This opportunity exists. I think there's a lot of momentum building toward it, but there are some you know key things that need to happen in quick order in order for you know both the U.S. and Mexico and the industry to really capitalize on this uh, on this opportunity. I think the first thing that I would note, which is an area where uh, you know the Mexican government has already made significant progress, as Gerardo just you know provided a very helpful overview of, but is really you know preparing a narrow and highly targeted recruitment strategy, and I think continuing to publicize that. So really focused on ATP. I think it's important to you know keep this strategy obviously aligned with Mexico's broader economic development strategy and the Plan Sonora. Which I know uh, Gerardo will uh, will probably share some additional insight on here as well. But I worry that by merging the semiconductor strategy with the broader plan, Sonora risks dilution. I think that for this strategy, another key area where I think both the the SIA and industry and both the U.S. and Mexican governments could really uh, you know improve upon is to do a better job of working more closely with North American end users. You know, the auto and electronics industries in particular, you know, the, um, 
a couple of the major uh, North American auto manufacturers have already been signing agreements with uh, chip manufacturers in order to try to you know build out their you know the resilience of their own chip supply chains. And I think that that's just a, a great example of you know how working with end users can really play a role in um, uh, you know building North American uh, uh, resilience. I think the second part is one that Rena already touched upon, and it's really taking sort of an immediate set of actions to bend to bend the cost curve. You know, incentives are an important part of this, even if it's you know sort of an, an ugly side of the business uh, for some. You know, I think both because of these like cost you know cost questions, but also because incentives really serve as a coordination function. You know, in an industry that really benefits from uh, you know from uh, you know co-location. Uh, you know, nobody wants to be the first to, to jump. And obviously Mexico does already have this existing footprint, but I think that by using incentives as part of this broader strategy to really, um, uh, you know, unify and get industry on the same page, you're going to be able to see sort of, you know, a number of, you know, hopefully a number of new investments announced simultaneously. Would love to see those also paired with a broader package of commitments. I think the U.S. can also really up its up its game on this front as you know part of the Chips Act. Uh, there was a uh, you know 500 million over five years that has been allocated to the State Department to um, uh, you know to help build uh, U.S. international partnerships to strengthen uh, supply chain resilience. I'd love to see a significant portion of that be dedicated to. Uh, uh, you know, partners working on strengthening U.S.-Mexico um, semiconductor supply chains. I think the third key thing here, which we've seen really move to the forefront of the news cycle over the last, uh, you know, two weeks, even since this, um, uh, you know, even since this panel has been announced as the security environment. I know both the U.S. and Mexico are, you know, very focused on, you um, you know, improving the security environment across the, uh, you know, across the, across both countries. Um, but I think in particular with a, you know, an industry that's, you know, uh, you know, so uh, high value add, you know, part too expensive, uh, you know, that the, the prospects of, um, you know, theft really are going to weigh on, uh, you know, investments. So I think that, um, you know, seeing progress across all three of those those areas is really going to be uh, be critical. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, David. And yeah, really tied it to some of the current events we've all been seeing. And just want to put a pin in that five hundred million dollar um, investment that you mentioned related to the State Department and the Chips Act. So, uh, as David mentioned, for the audience benefit, this is a, a small piece of the overall fifty two billion dollar package from the Chips and Science Act, specifically targeting. Uh, U.S. cooperation with allies around the world, uh, so not not just North America, but but all of our allies, and a key part of that uh, could be working with Mexico, and and we also think could be working on a workforce specifically, which is a shared challenge that's come up in a couple of the uh, conversations so far. And so my last question uh, for Gerardo, and then we'll kind of do uh, more open questions. Uh, Gerardo, what, what has Mexico been doing to become even more attractive for, for semiconductor companies? You heard David mention briefly Plan Sonora. Uh, what is that and what does it mean specifically for semiconductors companies? Yes, thank you, Kevin, for this relevant question. For Mexico, it's very important to have this opportunity to share what we are doing. And uh, first, I would like to begin with what we have been working with the Semiconductor Industry Association with SIA, we are very grateful and we recognize all the coordinated work that we have been developing for over a year. We thank uh, John Elfer, Jimmy Goodrich, Rina Palgetsen, and all the team. They have been very supportive and we value the partnership that we have with them. And as you know, Kevin, we also have developed a very strong partnership with Arizona State University. As you may know, uh, Arizona State University has the largest school of engineering in North America, and they are very specialized on semiconductor uh, industry in research and development. And the partnership that we create and we subscribed last year with Arizona State University and the state of Sonora and the embassy in order to develop the curricula of uh, the workforce development for the semiconductor engineering in Mexico is very relevant. So uh, we also are aware 
of how important are the incentives for the industry. We know that the Asian countries are very aggressive, offering uh, packages of incentives very substantial, and Mexico is working on this. We are uh, developing different projects aimed to create this competitive ecosystem to the semiconductor value chain in Mexico. And uh, for the president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, the starting point is Sonora as a pilot program. Uh, Plan Sonora will develop and create synergies for the rest of the country and uh, an ecosystem that includes clean energy, human talent, infrastructure, and electromobility. So this is a, a substantive package incentives that uh, Plan Sonora includes as a binational security strategy to promote automotive, semiconductor, and electromobility industries. The key elements of Plan Sonora are uh, the electromobility supply chain that includes value added to the critical mineral sector and integration to the supply chain from the lithium exploration and extraction to the inclusion of lithium in electric vehicle batteries and electric vehicles. Number two is the human talent. So curricula programs, according to binational strategy, focused on workforce development with collaboration between state and federal governments and the private sector and Arizona State University is part of this effort. Number three, clean energy. In Sonora, there is the biggest solar energy generation plant in, in South America. Uh, this solar plant is located in Puerto Peñasco, which is the seventh largest worldwide. And there are plans to build more clean energy plants close to the US border in order to make sure there is the supply of clean energy to California, Arizona, New Mexico, and other US Southern states. Uh, number four is the cutting edge infrastructure program as part of building a modern infrastructure in the border states of Mexico with the US. And this plan includes a Northwest Logistic Gate Plan to improve land and uh, connectivity by air to several projects. So in short, uh, we are developing this substantive incentive package in order to attract all the interested stakeholders of the industry of North America. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Gerardo. And I guess I'll ask one more question for everybody, and then we'll see uh, any questions from the audience. And this question ties back to a few remarks we've had about the urgency of this moment. And it's a question of, what do we need to see by the end of this year? So we're in March, uh, we're not quite halfway through the year. Um, the industry is making decisions rapidly about its investments. Uh, in terms of the US-Mexico relationship and semiconductor specifically, um, for all of you, you know, what do you think needs to happen by December uh, for us to move forward and for this uh, potential partnership around semiconductors to be successful? Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, I would start with the workforce uh, piece, uh, which you know we, we've talked about. Um, you know, across all of the countries, you know, both and I would say both in the U.S. and in Mexico, there needs to be a real uh, collaboration between the industry um, and the curriculum. So when graduates, um, you know, are finished with their education now. Um, they're almost always unprepared to work in this industry because it's very specialized and needs training. So there needs to be uh, a training program which is developed in conjunction with the companies. Um, and I think creating those alliances uh, are very important. Um, further than this, you know, I think by the end of the year for this um, partnership to go forward, we need to see some clarity on tax incentives around um, this education piece. Um, as well as the incentives that we that we spoke about further, you know, I think there's been a lot of encouraging news out of the different states, um, and hopefully we can see something on the federal level. I'm happy to share some thoughts next if we want to go in and stay stay in order here. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think building uh, again on what on what Rena said, you know, I came up with a list of of you know quickly five things that I would you know really want to see by the end of this year to continue driving progress. I think the first is you know using this you know platform, this cooperative mechanism that's already been developed through the HLED and through the NALS, the High Level Economic Dialogue and the North America Leaders Summit. I would love to see that move beyond um, you know cooperation and new process oriented announcements toward really executing upon some of the more concrete commitments that have already been announced you know two that really come to mind are the uh you know the pilot project and um the supply chain mapping exercise that i saw earlier i think second in rena's comments i think you know i would love to see you know a more detailed um you know more detailed information both from the uh, both from the Mexican government around you know, potential incentives, but I think there's also a big role for industry here. You know, through one of these uh, TCO total cost of ownership studies that I mentioned earlier, I think that that's a real opportunity to help um, uh, you know increase insight into what the costs actually are. Because we you know we can talk about sort of reducing costs all day, but if you don't have a baseline from where you're reducing them from, or sort of what the current level of cost competitiveness is, uh, you know, I think that that can certainly both, you know, improve the quality and sort of, you know, help, you know, help those designing incentives know where to target them. Uh, so we can increase, increase the, you know, the quality of public policy in addition to, to you know, helping better inform, uh, you know, industry investment decisions. Uh, would love to see the State Department uh, direct some of this funding toward U.S.-Mexico projects, including the ASU um, uh, you know, uh, Mexican government workforce development initiative. I think that's a prime candidate for that funding. And I think finally, I'd like to see some recruitment wins. I think if if there isn't actual, if there aren't, if there isn't progress on investment decisions by the end of this year, I, I worry that the the window is is sort of reaching its. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of time still, but I worry that that will mean that the window the window has uh, has been at least partially missed. Yeah. And I would like to jump in and compliment the, the comments of uh, Rina and David. Uh, and I, I agree, uh, timing here is critical. We need to deliver results in the short run. And that is why the three governments are committed, strongly committed, I may say, in uh, working together and in coordination in order to develop a better uh, competitive and feasible ecosystem in North America for the semiconductor industry. As you all know, and as David also mentioned, in the North America Leaders Summit that took place in January of this year in Mexico, the three presidents agreed to organize the Semiconductor Forum on Critical Minerals in order to map in North America what are the opportunities that we, that we have, what are the stakeholders, and to develop student mobility in coordination with the three governments. So one of the things that we would like to see and that we're working on is to uh, advance on these uh, project uh, programs that we are coordinating and developing with the US and Canada as well. So we, we know that we have to work together. We, have, we know that we have to act fast, and we are committed to do so through the NALS, the North American Leaders Summit, and through the high level economic dialogue between the US and Mexico. All the agencies of Mexico are fully involved and fully committed to provide results on this regard. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. I think that sets a good target for all of us working together and, and with other partners and not here today to try to get the relationship really at full speed by the end of the year. And that will look like hopefully workforce pilot programs, uh, incentives, big announcements in terms of investment. If, you know, if we could be in December and have all those things moving forward, I think we could all be really, really pleased uh, with the work that's going on this year. So with that, I'll see if Isabel has any questions from the audience that she'd like to pass along. If not, I have more questions too, but I know she's been keeping track of our audience questions. So Isabel, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, we have a few questions from the audience. I'm gonna start with this one. And how can the partnership between Mexico and the United States address the disconnect between research on semiconductors and the general semiconductor industry? In other words, how can how can the partnership reach the technology value of death? Well, thanks, Isabel. Maybe I'll just take a quick stab at it. And if others want to weigh in as well, um, 
you know, at, at ASU, we've been really focused on moving ideas to prototypes to full scale production. So every semiconductor starts with an idea, but to turn it into a product takes a lot of steps. Uh, a lot of researchers have to work on that and companies. And so if you think about ways we might do that on both sides of the border, um, a big idea that's been proposed in the past is maybe a shared national lab uh, that could work on semiconductor technologies together between our two countries. Uh, the key being access to these really specialized facilities and infrastructure to help turn uh, concepts into prototypes and, and actual products over time. So that's my big idea on that one. Uh, we're not there yet. We have to start with start small, work towards it. But I think over time, uh, if we want to really supercharge the relationship and, and come up with great products together, uh, that's one way we might do it. But we'd love to hear what others think on the panel as well. Yes, well, I would like to jump in. Uh, this is a very relevant question as well, especially because uh, here in Mexico, we are trying to learn from the success stories and what the success uh, collaborations have been uh, applied in, the, in this industry in the past. For instance, the project that Intel developed with ASU in Vietnam is a good example for us of how we can collaborate and how we can develop similar schemes in Mexico in order to uh, develop the workforce. I would like also to mention that as an example of the coordinated work and effort between the three governments, the Chips and Science Act includes an international force fund for workforce development on which Mexico is applying and willing to, to receive finance in order to develop workforce and collaborate with the US and, and the Department of State on this regard. Thank you. I think I can quickly add just one final thing there, which is that that's obviously a very important piece of the equation, particularly as the US and you know, North America as a whole uh, really drives toward uh, you know regaining um, uh, you know its advantage in cutting edge chips. But I think one of the areas where this you know where binational cooperation can really help as well, particularly when you're looking at sort of many of the main North American end users like the automotive industry, uh, is sort of in the legacy chip space. So you know semiconductor chips that are not necessarily at the cutting edge, but are already uh, sort of in production and are older or older models. And I think that, you know, particularly, you know, when you're looking at, uh, you know, DAO chips that are manufactured by Texas Instruments, by um, Skyworks, by Infineon, obviously are going to want to continue making technological progress in those areas. But, um, you know, it's not necessarily the most high tech, most advanced. So I think it's, it's you know, important to note that there are all of these different areas and sort of segments of cooperation where the U.S. and Mexico can really build a, you know, a strong foundation for this partnership. Well, let's see, Isabel, any other questions? Yeah. We have a couple, we could probably take one to two more from the audience. Okay, awesome. So, um, this is Anonymous, and it says, there is a lot of talk about near sharing and ally sharing these days, which might make geopolitical sense. But will this trend face fatal resistance in Washington among protectionist politicians who want all near sharing to come to the US and not to North America as a region? We recently had a Republican president who shamed US companies investing in Mexico and demo democratic leaning Unions are also concerned about this. This is a very relevant question, Isabel, especially because the base of the success of the USMCA and NAFTA is that the three countries complement each other. Semiconductor industry is a so complex industry that a single country cannot develop itself all that process and cannot integrate vertically around all the chain. So necessarily they need and we need to specialize everyone on which we have comparative advantages. So the US and Canada in a way, they are specialized and they are more competitive in the processes on which they are intensive in capital and technology. And Mexico can complement that specializing in the labor intensive processes. 
So we need each other. We need to work together and have a region a self-sufficient in the production of semiconductors and developing the technology on that regard as well. Thank you. I would also add to that um, a bit, you know, uh, I think our government is very invested in making sure the supply chain is diverse and resilient. Um, you know, part of that indication is from the 500 million, which is part of the CHIPS Act, which is all for international investment, in fact, to help uh, locations which might need some help with infrastructure, um, maybe workforce development programs, things like that um, to, to get started and kind of get up and running. Um, so I think there's definitely, in Washington, there's a big desire to make sure that the supply chain is resilient and diverse. And it simply isn't done in the US, isn't entirely done in the US. Um, as Gerardo was just saying, um, many pieces of the supply chain, which are labor intensive are already done in, in East Asia and in China. So those things are not coming back to the US and they, you know, if possible, it would be uh, better to be able to, to move those locations to places which are allies with the US um, and, so, and complement um, the additional manufacturing that is happening here. Um, in addition, you know, the industry is facing in every country about 50,000 to 100,000 people shortage is in labor. So there's no way that we would be able to kind of increase all of the manufacturing and be able to meet those workforce uh, needs in any one location in any case. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's a large desire from many places to be able to make sure that we're working together um, and that in the future when there's shocks like the pandemic or other things that could arise, um, that the risk is more spread out. I think I'll add I'll add two points on to the great uh, great ones made by uh, uh, Gerardo and uh, and Rina. Um, and I think one is that you know the shifting geopolitical context is really you know underlying and the pandemic you know are really underlying a pretty significant shift in how these issues are being discussed in Washington. I think that in combination with the USMCA has really helped to reduce some of the prior political resistance. So I think I'm, I'm optimistic that we're turning a new page on North American cooperation. I think the other thing which is really critical to note and is something I'm sure Kevin can speak to is that a lot of this is happening at the subnational level. I think cooperation at the state level here and in state capitals, both in the US and Mexico are going to be a key driver of semiconductor cooperation uh, and that that's that's really that's really um you know within this broader framework that's been set up by the federal governments of the US Mexico and Canada that uh, the states are where you're really going to see a lot of the progress here which also helps I think tone down some of the um uh the political uh, uh political rhetoric and, and competition so I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that Kevin yes and I will also would like to say something else um near nearshoring and relocation it's not just a political decision it's a business decision so we have to take this into consideration in order to make to the companies and to the private sector uh, a, attractive uh, ecosystems and competitive conditions to invest and to have profitable projects in in a region so uh, we are working on this as well in a coordinated way in order to make this happen, not only as a political uh, narrative, but it's a business decision that we have to take care of. Thank you. Thanks, Rado, and, and totally agree. Ultimately, this is a decision that, that businesses will make and the role that states and universities and, and other actors play is really critical. Um, I think one of the things that surprised me as I've learned more about the semiconductor industry is how diverse the skill sets are that are required. I mean, the great thing about the industry is that employment is available for people of all different skills, of all different educational attainment levels. And so uh, it really is a win-win on both sides of the border to have more um, facilities for semiconductors because the types of jobs that are created are high paying jobs. Not all of them require college degrees. Uh, and it becomes available to a wide range of, of folks that can take those jobs if they have the skills. And that's where you know, ASU and other partners come come in working with you know, some of the folks on this on this call as well to help train up the workforce to to take those jobs and fill the gap that Rena talked about, which is present in pretty much every country around the world. It really is a shared challenge. Um, well, with that, 
let's see, Isabel, do you have any short questions? Final, final, yeah, we have final one. Thought, one more really quick. Yeah, this comes from Fernando Loureiro, Loureiro from Intel. And he's asking what specific, specifically can be done or expected as concrete deliverables by the recent announcement of the North America Semiconductor Corridor. I hope it's a short one. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, the short deliverable and the short answer for that is what the three countries, North, uh, Mexico, the US and Canada are working in, in the framework of the NALS, uh, the North American Leader Summit. And we are uh, envisioning uh, a, a meeting next April. We try to organize it soon in, in Phoenix, so maybe it can happen there. But the three governments are working in order to deliver soon this uh, project and to develop it uh, in an effective and competitive way. Thank you. Thanks, and I, I think with that, um, maybe we'll, we'll close out. I know we're, we're already past the, the top of the hour here, and I just wanna end by, by thanking our, our panelists. Thank you so much for all of your great insights, your analysis, all of your work behind the scenes. And I don't think that the relationship between the United States and Mexico on this particular topic would be anywhere near where it is today without each of your individual efforts. And also thank you to uh, Isabel and, and our partners who have hosted us today. It's been a great conversation. Um, the first of, I hope many, because as we set some ambitious targets for this year, uh, you know, December is gonna be here quickly. I think if we can get uh, the kinds of things we talked about, the incentives, the workforce pilot program, a really strong convening with industry, whether in DC or Arizona, um, that will be really critical for us to move the relationship forward. So with that, um, thank you all so much and looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, thank you Rina. Thank you, David. And thank Thanks you very Rina. much. And thank, uh, thank the audience for joining us today. And until next time, muchas gracias. <laughs>